Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Rizzuto, and I am the program manager at Change, the Center for Holocaust, Human Rights, and Genocide Education. This is our August virtual lunch and learn, LGBT experiences during the Holocaust. We created our virtual lunch and learn series back in April, and we've been holding various lunch and learns on Holocaust topics, um, products regarding modern genocide, human rights violations, and uh, personal survivor narratives from Holocaust and genocide survivors. So if you want to see our previous Lunch and Learns, you can go to our YouTube channel at youtube.com backslash change with two H's, BCC. Um, and that information is available on our website, which I'll talk about at the end of this Lunch and Learn. But I do want to dive in um, by starting with why we created this Lunch and Learn. So as many of you probably know, um, New Jersey is a mandate state for Holocaust education. Uh, we were one of the earliest back in 1994, um, the state legislature voted to require that um, New Jersey public schools discuss issues of bias, prejudice, and bigotry, including bullying through the teaching of the Holocaust and genocide for all children in grades K through 12. So at some at every level between kindergarten and 12th grade in New Jersey public schools, students are supposed to be discussing issues like prejudice and bigotry and bias um, through the lens of learning about the Holocaust and genocide. And um, the New Jersey Commission on Holocaust Education has worked side by side with schools across the state to make sure that the material is age appropriate and uh, vetted so that students get real Holocaust education um, here in New Jersey. So that happened in 1994. And then in February of 2019, Governor Murphy signed into law the inclusive curriculum mandate. And this mandate goes into effect in uh, August or September 2020, whenever your local public school opens. Um, and this mandate requires that all New Jersey public schools teach the contributions of LGBT people and people with disabilities. So change found ourselves at the great intersection of being able to talk about LGBT contributions and the contributions of LGBT people and Holocaust education and Holocaust history. And that's how this Lunch and Learn was born. Um, as many of you know, these Lunch and Learns are made possible through the support of our members and through viewers like you. Um, so if you would like to make a donation, you can do so at our website, changewith2hs.org. Um, and that will help create new virtual Lunch and Learns uh, in the future. We have a great program coming in the fall, and I'll talk a little bit about that at the end as well. When it comes to LGBT experiences during the Holocaust, um, it's important to keep in mind the sheer number of victims. Um, we know that over 6 million Jewish victims um, were taken and murdered by the Nazi, by the Germans during the Holocaust. Um, alongside those Jewish victims were Jehovah's Witnesses, um, people with disabilities who were some of the earliest victims, um, Soviet prisoners of war, and men who were found loving other men. During the Holocaust from 1933 until 1945, it is believed that over 100,000 homosexual men were arrested by German officials. 50,000 to 65,000 of those men were imprisoned, and between 5,000 and 15,000 of the homosexual men imprisoned were deported to concentration camps in Germany and Poland. Um, we don't know how many were killed, but we do believe that there's, uh, there are estimates by scholars of around 9,000 or two thirds of the homosexual men who had been deported being murdered in those concentration camps. Prior to the Nazis gaining control of Germany um, during the Weimar Republic between 1919 and 1932, there was a great uh, freedom for homosexual men and women across Germany, but specifically in Berlin. Um, and in Berlin, there really is this acceptance, whether it's stated or not, of homosexuality. Um, this is in direct violation of an, a law put in place in 1871 called Paragraph 175. Um, Paragraph 175 basically made it illegal for any sexual acts to take place between two men, regardless of whether or not it was consensual, regardless of the ages of the men. Um, really, if two men were found engaged in a sexual act, they could both be imprisoned for life. Um, in 1919, 
there was a German, oh, I'm sorry, a German Jewish homosexual man who took up the charge against paragraph 175, and that was Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld. Um, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld founded the Institute of Sexual, Sexual Research in Berlin in 1919, and he also started a petition in 1919 asking for the repeal of paragraph 175. This petition was really popular. Um, it was signed by writers and doctors and scholars across Germany asking that homosexual men be given the freedom to engage in consensual, consensual romantic and sexual relations with other homosexual men. Um, this institute was founded by Dr. Hirschfeld when he was older, he was in his 50s at the time, and he was the founding leader of this movement to bring more freedom to, homose to homosexuals across Berlin, but also across Germany. Um, if you've seen any of the black and white films that Marlena Dietrich was in or um, Greta Garbo, you'll see that there's this freedom to androgyny. Um, women are allowed to wear suits and smoke cigars in public, and they really in, in, embrace this freedom of gender and sexual expression uh, that hadn't existed anywhere else in the world up until this point. Um, and people get used to it, right? The people of Berlin get used to this concept that homosexuality is something that they can accept. And then in 1925, a homosexual man is found guilty of several accounts of murder. Um, and his, his narrative is published throughout Germany, right? Newspapers across the country are talking about this gay man who committed multiple murders and was now going to be executed for the state, uh, for, by the state in 1925. And this really does push back the last six years of Dr. Hirschfeld's work. Um, but he and his team at the Institute of Sexual Research are able to fight the narrative and continue to support freedom for homosexuals throughout the Weimar Republic. Um, Dr. Hirschfeld was known as the Einstein of sex, and just so that you kind of see how funny he was, when he found out about that during an interview, he turned to the interviewer and said, I think that Dr. Einstein is the Hirschfeld of physics. Um, Dr. Hirschfeld also had a wide range of contacts across Europe. Uh, one of the most well-known writers at the time, Christopher Isherwood, was a homosexual man who spent some time in Berlin with Dr. Hirschfeld, and he wrote about his experiences in the famous book, Goodbye to Berlin. Um, if you haven't read the book, you've probably heard of the, play, the musical that was based on the book, Cabaret, uh, which started Liza Minnelli's career back in the 1950s. So, uh, this is the, the high point of homosexual culture in Germany in the, the 1920s and early 1930s. And that's why it was threatening. Um, the Nazis come to power in 1933, and one of the first things that they do once they've seized power is burn the books at the, uh, sexual, the Institute for Sexual Knowledge. Um, so the book burnings begin on May 6th, and they're led by the National Socialist Student League. So a bunch of students from local universities throughout Berlin um, who have aligned themselves with the Nazi party go to the Institute of Sexual Research and they select over 20,000 books on sex, uh, sexuality, on gender expression, on the beginning of a transgender movement, um, research into both the scientific elements of homosexuality and the social elements of homosexuality are taken to giant bonfires and set on fire. And you can see here um, in this photo, one of the members of the National Socialist uh, Student League is going through the books to select which ones he's going to burn. Um, the other student, we're not sure if he's a student or a, a part of the Institute of Sexual Research, but he is also collecting books. Losing these 20,000 volumes on research um, was devastating to the field of sexuality and gender studies. Um, Many, much of this was research that either Dr. Hirschfeld did himself or scholars came to Berlin to conduct, conduct the research because of the freedom within the Weimar Republic, and it wasn't published anywhere else. So when these books were burned, that knowledge was burned with them. Um, while the students were burning these books, one of the rallying cries that they used was Brenna Hirschfeld, which means burn Hirschfeld. There was a recognition among the student groups that Hirschfeld was a leader in sexuality and gender studies. Luckily for Dr. Hirschfeld, he was not in Berlin at the time. In 1930, he sensed a change in the um, social atmosphere in Berlin, and he believed that it was no longer a safe place for a homosexual man, especially an older homosexual man 
who had global acclaim as the founder of this Institute of Sexual Research. So Dr. Hirschfeld left in 1930 and went on a world tour. He stopped in the United States. He spent time in China in India, um, spent some time on the African continent. And in 1933, when he wanted to come home, he realized that he was no longer welcomed there. So he actually went to France, um, where he passed away in 1935 of heart complications. The book burnings are often seen as one of the turning points when it comes to Nazi control. This was the, the Nazi party establishing complete control of the German state. And it is reminiscent of another um, German writer, Heinrich Heine, who wrote, where they burn books, they will in the end burn humans too. And as we know from the history of the Holocaust, the book burnings in 1933 were the harbinger of the uh, gas chambers that came in the late 1930s and early 1940s. Um, not only did the student groups go in and burn these 20,000 volumes, but they also found lists of homosexual men living in Berlin and throughout Germany. Uh, one of these lists was the um, subscription list for the magazine Der Eigene. So Der Eigene, which means the own or the unique, um, referring to homosexual men who were unique from other men, was a, a gay periodical. It was the first periodical uh, dedicated to homosexual studies in the world, as far as we know. Um, and it was founded by uh, Adolf Brand in 1896. So from 1896 to 1932, Adolf Brand published Der Eigene uh, from his apartment. In 1932, as the Nazis were gaining more control, they actually went into Adolf Brand's apartment seized all of his publication materials and thus disrupted the publication of Der Eigene. Um, if you Google Der Eigene, you can find it online. The first like 15 issues are available. They, all, they are all in German though. So if you don't read German, that might prohibit you from reading these articles. Not long after the book burnings, the Nazi party took control of Germany. And so I've been saying the Nazi party for the first three slides, but now we're going to recognize that um, from this point forward, it's the German government and the German people who are committing these crimes. Prior to 1933, when the Nazi party took over Germany, um, they relied heavily on stormtroopers, which was a kind of secret police employed by Hitler to um, get in the way of any political rivals, whether that meant getting the political rivals out of the country, um, making, it, making life difficult for them, or as a last resort, possibly, murder. Um, the stormtroopers were led by Ernst Röhm, and Ernst Röhm was a World War I veteran who met Hitler in 1919, when Hitler was still young and had not yet become this political mastermind that was going to take over the country. Um, Ernst Röhm is actually the man who got Hitler involved in the German Workers' Party, which would eventually become the Nazi Party. And he was a mentor to young Hitler. Um, they had a very close relationship. In fact, Ernst Röhm was the only man allowed to refer to Adolf Hitler by his nickname, Dolphy. Um, so you can see that there was a, a paternal relationship between, between the two of them. And Ernst Röhm, as the leader of the stormtroopers, was really willing to do whatever it took to make sure that his friend Hitler uh, was able to take control of Germany. Once the Nazi party took control in 1933, they quickly gained power over the German military. And once you have control over the military, the need for these stormtroopers isn't there anymore. So Adolf Hitler was forced to realize that he was going to have to ask his good friend Röhm to retire. The problem was that Rome had dedicated his life to the Nazi cause. He had dedicated his life to nationalist movements within Germany, um, and he probably wasn't going to retire. So Heinrich Himmler, who was Hitler's second in command, soon realized that Rome was going to be a problem. He was going to be a thorn in uh, Himmler's side, and Himmler was already pretty homophobic. Um, so when he determined that Ernst Röhm, who was a known homosexual, was going to have power within the Nazi party, he decided he was going to do whatever it took to get rid of Röhm. In June of 1934, the evening of June 28, 1934, you have the beginning of the Night of Long Knives, in which Himmler and his team coordinated attacks on over 300 men involved in the Stormtroopers organization. Um, these men, including Ernst Röhm, were murdered and over the next four days. Uh, you can see here in the newspaper 
Uh, this is the Bethlehem, uh, I'm sorry, the Bethlehem Globe Times, which is a newspaper out of Pennsylvania. Um, the headline is, believe 500 are killed in German revolt. So the way that the American newspapers interpreted this was the, the stormtroopers were trying to stage a coup and the Nazi party had to put down the coup. Um, in order to justify the murder of Ernst Röhm and the 300 stormtroopers, Himmler actually had a law passed that said that physical proof of homosexuality was no longer required. So prior to the Nazi party taking control, in order to have a man or two men or more men in prison, you had to show physical proof that they had been engaged in a sexual relationship. Whether this was catching them in the act, um, having one of the men turn on the others and accuse them of homosexuality, um, photographs, something that, pr that was physical proof that homosexuality had taken place. Um, after July 1934, Himmler's new law meant that physical proof was no longer needed. And like many Nazi laws in the 1930s, this law was considered retroactive. And so what Himmler did was he said, well, those 300 men that we um, murdered had been guilty of homosexuality. Uh, we heard rumors, we knew that it was going on, and we wanted to make sure that the German people were not subjected to homosexuality within the stormtroopers. So we had to purge our ranks to make sure that the Nazi party remained pure. With Rome out of the way, uh, the Nazis were able to pass a few more laws within German politics uh, in the 1930s. The first was on June 26, 1935, um, and this was the amendment to the law for the prevention of offspring with hereditary diseases. The two photos that you see here are from the United States. Um, they're actually from the Society for Eugenics, which was a, a national organization here in the US. Um, the photo with the tree says, release the stranglehold of hereditary disease and unfitness. Um, and the black and white photograph is a display at a national convention of the Eugenic Society in the 1930s. I put these photos up because it is necessary to remember that eugenics was not unique to Germany. Um, you know, the United States, the United Kingdom, France were all a part of this eugenics movement in the 1930s. And a part of that eugenics movement was the purification of the human race by getting rid of hereditary diseases, including seizures, um, any sort of developmental disability, and homosexuality. So homosexuality became a hereditary disease in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, popular opinion believed that a gay man, if he had children, would pass down that homosexual gene to his sons. And so this law pretty much says that um, anyone who is accused of being a homosexual can be imprisoned between three months and 10 years. Um, unless the man is un the man accused is under the age of 21, so it does protect minors in that way. Um, and then two days later, on June 28th, they actually split the law so that um, minors under 21 can also be accused of homosexuality and be imprisoned for that time. So it's really these two laws passed in late June of 1935 that empower the Germans to now arrest homosexual men. Um, imprison them with no physical proof of homosexual acts taking place and do with them as they want once they are imprisoned. At this time in, in 1935 to 1936, you have homosexual men arriving in concentration camps. Um, and this is both as prisoners and as the soldiers that are guarding the camps. Many of the homosexual SS officers who were taking over these camps would offer um, better rations to boys, mostly boys, boys under the age of 21, um, who were, who they engage in sexual acts with. So obviously this was rape, um, but the young boys would then receive extra food and they would get less work. And these young boys who were taken in by the SS officers and forced to perform sexual acts were known as pipalin, which means dolly boys. Um, so you can see that, that language of Dolly boys then becomes Nancy boys and continues both in Germany and the Anglophone or US and British worlds um, through the 20th century. So even in the beginning of the camps, homosexuals or young men who are willing or able to perform homosexual acts um, are seen as different and othered by other camp members. One of the young boys who um, eventually ends up imprisoned is Gad Beck. And Gad Beck was a Jewish boy who was born in 1923. Um, the photo here at the top is a picture of Gad and his sister Miriam. 
They were born to a Jewish father and a Christian mother, but his mother actually, uh, their mother actually converted prior to their birth um, because her husband's family wanted the children to be Jewish. Um, although they were not very rich, Gad's family did save money to send him to a private school, and it was a private Christian school. At first, it was fine. He was young. It was the early 1930s before the Nazis had really seized control. But by 1933 to 1934, um, Gad started to experience anti-Semitism from his classmates and from his teachers. One day, his mom goes to watch him perform in a, in a school-sanctioned event. And even though Gad does well in the event and should have received a medal, because he is a Jewish boy, they refuse to give him a medal. And he is humiliated in front of his mother. Um, after witnessing this, Gad's mother actually pulls him out of the school and sends him to a Jewish school. Now, Gad is Jewish. Um, his mother converted. His father is, is Jewish. And you would, one would have thought that at 12 years old, he would have known his Jewish identity. But the Beck family was pretty uh, agnostic. They didn't really celebrate Shabbat. They didn't really uh, recognize the Jewish holidays. And so at this young age of 12, Gad starts to realize that he's a Jewish boy and he starts to embrace his Jewish identity. At the same time, um, going to this Jewish school, Gad starts to experience homosexual urges. Um, he becomes involved with some young boys his own age and they start to experiment. And as he gets older, that experimentation continues while the Holocaust is taking place. So it's important to remember that he's a young boy, he's a teenager, and yes, there are terrible things going on outside, but for him, he's 16 and there's a cute boy in the Zionist uh, youth group that he's a part of. So Gad and this young boy are supposed to be watching the cows and learning how to do agrarian uh, work because the goal of this Zionist work group is that the teenage boys will learn the necessary skills to then go uh, to Palestine where they can start new lives um, and no longer have to be subjected to the anti-Semitism of the German government at this time. Gad and his friend go out to a field one day to mine the cows and that's actually where Gad loses his virginity out in the field with the boy. Um, the two young men decide that they're going to go to Palestine together and start their lives together and they're planning for this and then Gad falls sick. Um, he has a minor operation and he wakes up thinking, okay, I, my operation is over, I'm all healed, I'm going to get on the boat and go to Palestine with my boyfriend. And then he finds out that the boat has already left for Palestine with his boyfriend aboard. So Gad's a little heartbroken. Um, he recognizes that his chance to leave Germany is pretty much shot as more anti-Semitism becomes apparent in the late 1930s. Um, he is able to stay in Berlin with his family because he and his sister, as daughters of a Jewish man, but a Christian woman, because she's considered Christian as her parents weren't Jewish, um, he's a Mischlinger, which means he's half Jewish and half German. Because of that, his family is allowed to stay in Berlin, but they need the help of their Christian family members in order to be protected. Um, Gad becomes very involved in the Berlin underground. Um, he starts to find ways to smuggle food into to Jews who are in hiding. Um, he works with his Christian contacts to make sure that Jews are able to get out of the city. And during his work with the Berlin underground, he meets another Jewish homosexual named Manfred Lewin. Um, at first, Manfred Lewin is hesitant to become, in, to become, become involved with Gad. Um, he's a good Jewish boy. He's in his early 20s, and he's afraid of disappointing his family by not getting married to a, a Jewish girl. However, over time, Manfred realizes that he's in love with Gad and that he can't imagine life without him. And the two begin a relationship, which continues for several months. One day, Gad is going to pick Manfred up for a date, and he finds out that Manfred and his family have been rounded up and are expected to be deported to Auschwitz pretty, pretty soon. Gad panics. He's not ready to lose Manfred. He's in love with Manfred. Um, Manfred had created a poetry book that Gad kept with him at all times, and it actually survived the Holocaust with Gad. And he just, he wasn't ready for the concept of losing this man that he loved. And so he went to his supervisor at the factory that the two boys, the two men worked at um, and said to his supervisor, they took Manfred, I need to go get him, um, can you help me? And he thought the supervisor was gonna give him money to bribe the German officials. But instead the supervisor says, 
I know a man who's about your size, who's part of the Nazi youth, you can go um, borrow his uniform, he lives with me. So Gad goes and gets the uniform and he puts it on. Now this is a, a good Jewish boy, right? He's, he, was, uh, he went to Jewish schools, his father is Jewish. Culturally, he's a Jewish boy and he recognizes that this could be death for him. If someone points him out and says, isn't that the boy who left school because he was Jewish? Or, oh, he went to school with me at the Jewish school. He could be found out in, in the lion's den, right? He's, he's walking into a German prison camp. But he puts on the Nazi youth uniform and he pulls up his, his um, he readies himself to go and talk to the German officials. And he gets to the camp and he turns to the German official and he says, I need Manfred Lewin to come with me. He is a Jew employed by my father and we're working on a construction site together. Um, I need Manfred because he knows the specifics about this site. I'll bring him back after the job is done. The German officer makes a joke saying, oh, but you, you have to bring him back. You can have him, but you must bring him back. And Gad, keeping in character says, of course I'm going to bring him back. What would I want with a Jew? So this is the way that Gad is able to get Manfred away from the Germans. And the two of them leave the camp and they're running and uh, Gad turns to Manfred and says, uh, I'm gonna give you some cash. You're gonna go to my uncle's house and you're going to hide there for a little bit until we can figure out what to do next. And in Gad's memoirs, he remembers what Manfred says to him. Manfred says, quote, Gad, I can't go with you. My family needs me. If I abandon them now, I could never be free. Gad then remembers that Manfred walked back to the camp and turned himself in. And um, in his memoirs, Gad says, quote, in those seconds watching him go, I grew up. We know now that um, Manfred and his entire family were deported to Auschwitz where they were all murdered. So Gad lost the love of his life. And he continuously referred to Manfred as the love of his life throughout his memoirs and um, in the testimony that he gave to the Shoah Foundation later in his life. So Gad is working at a, a factory in Berlin um, in 1943 when the Germans decide that they are going to make Berlin Judenfrei or free of the Jews. This is supposed to be Himmler's birthday present to Hitler in 1943. So Himmler demands that all Jewish men who are married to Christian women be rounded up. These Jewish men who are married to Christian women are really the last of the Jews allowed to legally remain in Berlin. Um, so, of course, Gad and his father, as two Jews related to Christian women, are rounded up and they are taken to a prison on Rosenstrasse, um, or Rose Street. This leads to the only peaceful protest that was successful in the Third Reich, in Nazi Germany. Um, these men who were rounded up, about 30,000 of them, were taken into the prisons and kept there with the expectation that they would be deported to various concentration camps. However, the women who loved them, the Christian women who loved them, staged a protest outside of the German prison, demanding that their husbands and their sons and their brothers and their, well, not their brothers, but their husbands and their sons and their brothers-in-law be released. Um, Gad remembers that his aunts, his Christian aunts, his mother's sisters, were there at the protest demanding that Gad and his father be released. And eventually, after a few days of protest, the Jewish men are released from the prisons um, and allowed to go back to the forced labor that they are all forced into. Gad's father is sent to the Jewish hospital in Berlin, um, where it becomes his job to work with um, e emptying Berlin of the Jews, while Gad continues his work at a local factory. During this time, between 1943 and 1945, is really the height of Gad's involvement in the Berlin underground. He makes connections across the city, um, he, raised, he rises up in the ranks pretty quickly. He's good at getting messages out and getting money in, which are really the two most important things as a member of the underground. Um, and he is well liked by a lot of the other members, especially the Christian members of the underground. However, at the, um, in with the winter of 1945, Gad and some of his friends are betrayed by another member of the underground and they are rounded up and imprisoned at the Jewish hospital Berlin um, where they are kept for the next few months until the Russians liberate Berlin in April of 1945. So he's lucky. For the most part in Gad's memoirs, you get the sense that he's very lucky and that his Christian connections are really what kept him alive. Um, his family is also able to survive through his mom's Christians, rel Christian relatives, and together the family emigrates to Israel in 1947. 
Gad it lives openly as a homosexual um, in Israel from 1947 until the mid-1970s, where he meets his life partner, um, Julius Laufer, and they remain together until Gad's, Gad's death in 2012. Um, in the 1970s, Gad moves back to Berlin for a bit to work with the Jewish communities there, and he then publishes his memoir in 1994. In the year 2000, um, his memoir becomes a, a documentary, Paragraph 175, and is translated into English as An Underground Life, Memoirs of a Gay Man in Nazi Berlin. So Gad's story tells us one um, testimony of the Holocaust and how a gay man's experiences really shaped how he survived. But for many others, they were caught up in this giant machine pushing procreation for the German race. Um, the German government at this time is really focused on ending abortion and ending homosexuality. And in doing both of these things, they create the central office for the combating of homosexuality and abortion uh, on October 10th, 1936. And this office is led by Josef Meisinger, who is very, very violent. In fact, he's so brutal that in 1947, he's actually executed for the brutality that he um, delves out in, Pol in Poland. So not the nicest man to put in charge of this office. And really the office is concerned with finding homosexual men, imprisoning them and forcing them to be castrated so that they cannot procreate and create more homosexual men. Um, and also preventing women from seeking abortion, preventing German Aryan women from uh, seeking abortion so that the German race can continue to grow. Around this time, um, Himmler is asked about his views on homosexuality, and he says, quote, if this vice continues, it will be the end of Germany. However, he's okay with homosexuality in other countries. So in the 1936 Olympics take place in Berlin, Himmler actually stops all of the homophobic um, laws that are in place in Berlin, allowing American and British and French homosexuals to live the lives that they want and attend gay bars, so that they can, the, the Germans can keep up this um, facade of being accepting of homosexuality. You might be asking, yes, I said there were 100,000 men um, who were arrested. What happened to homosexual women? Well, uh, according to the German Committee on Population Policy, quote, it is supposed to be of no practical significance whether the woman remains frigid or whether sexual intercourse is a real experience for her, end quote. Um, from various research, including that done for the hidden Holocaust, gay and lesbian persecution in Germany, um, corrective rape was heavily used by German soldiers on German women who uh, exhibited homosexual inclinations because it was believed that as long as a woman conceived, she was doing the right thing for the German people. So her own homosexuality wasn't important. Um, in fact, Rudolf Hulse, who was in charge of Auschwitz, uh, the homosexuals in Auschwitz, tried to re-educate homosexuals, um, for first by giving them some of the hardest labor jobs, um, and then by uh, forcing them to have sexual relations with women prisoners at the prison. So there was this belief that they could change homosexuals and homosexual men and force them to become straight and thus continue to populate Germany with more German children. So it really did come down to growing the German race. So on the other side, um, homosexuality also existed in the Allied forces, right? And the question becomes, how did the US, the UK, France, and Russia respond to homosexuality during World War II? Um, so I want to bring you, your attention to another survivor, Pierre Steele, who was a French Holocaust survivor. Um, he was born and raised in Alsace. Alsace is on the border of France and Germany. Um, and prior to World War II, it was a part of France. In France, homosexuality had been legalized back in 1792 by Napoleon Bonaparte. And so homosexuality was legal, right? Pierre could live openly as a homosexual man and it shouldn't have been an issue. However, when the Germans took over France in 1940, Alsace was recognized by the German government as a German um, region and the people th therein became German citizens. So Pierre was now considered a German homosexual and he was rounded up alongside other Alsatian homosexual men um, and taken to a prison where he was brutally tortured by the German guards. He was then deported to Schirmeck concentration camp in May of 1941 um, and he was kept there for several months, eventually being let out in November of 1941. Um, 
According to Pierre in his memoir, um, Moi Pierre Seal, which has been translated into English, the um, homosexuals kept at Shemek concentration camp were treated very badly. Um, he actually watched his boyfriend at the time, Joe, be murdered by the German guards. So in his memoir, he writes um, that he was there for several months. He was, was imprisoned at Shermek from May 1941 to November 1941. And then he was forced to serve in the German army from 1941 until liberation in 1945. However, because he was a known homosexual, he was not allowed to carry any weaponry. So he was forced to serve on the Eastern Front um, doing menial labor tasks, but he was never able to defend himself against the oncoming Russian army, um, who would not know, obviously, that he had been forced to work there and would have seen him as just another German soldier. Um, luckily, he does survive the Holocaust and World War II, and he goes on to marry a woman and have two children in the 1950s, denouncing his homosexuality and trying to live as a straight man. By the 1970s, Pierre realizes that he's never going to be happy with his wife and they separate and are later divorced, um, but he continues to keep his homosexuality quiet because in France, it is now illegal to be a homosexual man. Um, in fact, homosexuality in France is not legalized again until 1982. Pierre finds out that there's research being done on homosexuals during the Holocaust in 1981, and he begins to share his narrative, eventually publishing his memoir in 1994. Um, the picture on the bottom there shows a picture of Pierre a little, a little time before he dies uh, in 2005. Last year in June, uh, while celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Riots, Paris created Pierre Seal Street in memory of this man who was brave enough to share his experiences as a homosexual in France during the Holocaust. Regarding contributions made by LGBT individuals um, to society, I want to turn everyone's attention to Dr. Alan Turing. Dr. Turing was a British homosexual man who worked with the government code and cipher school during World War II, eventually cracking the Enigma code. Um, I know no one can see it, but I'm currently wearing a shirt that says Dr., uh, uh, Dr. Alan Turing fought Nazis with science. And he did this by cracking the encoded letters, uh, the encoded telegrams that the Germans would send to their ships, telling the Navy and the Air Force where to bomb next. So by cracking this code, by cracking the Enigma code, Dr. Turing was actually able to tell the British government what places in England were going to be bombed next. And this allowed the British government to um, create strategic decisions that would help end the war early. Although counterfactual history is always difficult, it's believed that Dr. Turing's breakthrough actually ended the war two years earlier than it could have ended, saving somewhere around 14 million lives. Dr. Turing is well known for the Turing test. Um, after World War II ended, he became involved in computer science, and he was one of the pioneers in artificial intelligence. The Turing test was a way to tell whether or not you're talking to a human or a robot. However, by the 1950s, uh, Dr. Turing's homosexuality became an issue. And in 1952, he and his boyfriend at the time were arrested um, after, the boyfriend, after Dr. Turing was robbed by someone that the boyfriend knew. Um, in 1952, Dr. Turing and his boyfriend were brought to court in Regina v. Turing and Murray, and they were both found guilty of homosexuality. However, because uh, Murray was under the age of 21, he was let off with a warning. Turing was forced to either serve prison time or go through chemical castration. And because he wanted to continue his work in the field of science, he decided to go with chemical castration. He lost his job with the British government and he was banned from ever visiting the United States because of his homosexual um, diagno di diagnosis. So for two years, he undergoes chemical castration, having estrogen pumped into his body um, pretty much on a daily basis. And it causes him to go into a deep depression. On June 7, 1954, um, at the age of 42, Dr. Turing bit into what is believed to be a poisoned apple laced with cyanide, um, and he was found the next morning by his housekeeper already dead. So he is believed by many that he committed suicide. The half-bitten apple was a um, tribute to his favorite uh, Disney movie, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, and today, Dr. Turing is immortalized by the Apple company. So if you look on your iPhone or on a MacBook, you'll see the half-bitten apple 
And Steve Jobs said that that was his tribute to Dr. Turing and Dr. Turing's early work on computer science. Um, Dr. Turing did not receive an apology from the United Kingdom until 2013, when the Alan Turing Law went into effect, officially pardoning and apologizing to all of the British men who were charged under the homosexual laws that remained in place until the 1960s. In the military, um, sodomy was made illegal in the US in June of 1920. So after World War I, there was this panic that too many of the soldiers had engaged in sodomy. And so a law was put into effect that continued to be in effect throughout World War II. Similar um, laws were put in place in Russia beginning in June of 1933. So by the time World War II started, um, homosexuality in the militaries was illegal uh, both in the United States and in the USSR. Beginning in 1942, there were actual um, Surgeon General warnings put out to the US military explaining that homosexual proclivities are disqualifying. If a man is believed to be homosexual, then he is not allowed to serve in the army. And once the Women's Army Corps starts in 1943, it is also said that if a woman is seen to be homosexual, she is also not allowed to serve in the US military. Dr. William Menninger, who was the director of the Psychiatry Consultants Division in the US military, worked with homosexual men in order to get them to pass the exams should they want to serve um, by telling them how to act straight. Um, his words, not mine. Also, uh, one woman who was interviewed after the fact and served in the Women's Army Corps, her name was Johnny Phelps, remembers that, quote, I found there was a tolerance for lesbianism if they needed you. If you had a job to do that was kind of a specialist job, or if you were in a theater of operations where bodies were needed, they tolerated anything just about, end quote. So as long as you were quiet about it or you were necessary, you could get away with being a homosexual in the US military. Um, this homosexuality in the Allied forces was written down in the Pulp Fiction novel, War Barracks, written by a French woman, Teresca Torres, and published in English in 1950. And this novel, War Barracks, shows um, female radio, um, oh my god, radio workers, I can't think of the word, there's a word, um, who served in the French military uh, fighting against the Germans in the 1940s. And there are some very open displays of homosexuality throughout the novel. In fact, War Barracks is seen as the first of the lesbian pulp novels that were very popular throughout the 1950s. So homosexuality in the armed forces wasn't really allowed in the Allied powers, but it was excused as long as you contributed to the armed forces and to um, the cause of ending World War II. After the Holocaust in the United States and Great Britain, we had the Lavender Scare in which um, military and government officials believed that homosexuals were a security risk. And so in the United States alone, over 5,000 men and women lost their jobs because of their homosexuality or perceived homosexuality uh, between 1945 and 1955. Um, it really was this fear that the USSR would find out that this worker was a homosexual and then blackmail them into providing the USSR with American and British state secrets. In Germany, homosexuality was not legalized until uh, 1968 in East Germany and 1969 in West Germany. And this meant that many of the men who had been um, persecuted under paragraph 175 by the German government during the Holocaust were persecuted again by the American and British and French governments in the West and by the Russian government in the East for their homosexuality throughout the 1950s and 1960s if they were discovered as homosexuals again. Um, it was not until 2002 that the German government officially pardoned all of the homosexuals that had been arrested, murdered, and deported um, during the Holocaust. So finally, there was justice served in 2002, long after many of the victims had passed away. I know that was a lot of information, um, and I think I went over time a little bit. But that was a brief overview of LGBT experiences during the Holocaust. Um, as many of you might have noticed, we didn't really talk about trans experiences during the Holocaust, and that's because for the German government, a trans man um, was seen as a lesbian and a trans woman was seen as a gay man. This, this distinction between gender and sexuality didn't exist for the German government, and so they would be persecuted um, depending on their gender assigned at birth. 
We hope that you'll join us for our next Lunch and Learn, um, Internment and Destruction Concentration Camps During the Armenian Genocide, which will take place on September 18th. Um, you'll be receiving an email shortly regarding that program. And again, if you'd like to support our virtual programming, um, we hope that you'll consider becoming a member uh, by going to www.change.org. On our website, you can also donate, catch up on, and catch up on our previous Lunch and Learn programs. I'm going to stop the share and open it up for questions. So if you have any questions, please type them in the group chat box. Um, you should be able to do that now. And thank you all for listening to me ramble about one of my favorite subjects. So any questions? I appreciate, oh, okay. I did not, Mara, that's a very good point. Um, the actual pink triangles. So the pink triangles um, were the designation assigned to homosexuals during the Holocaust. Um, many of you are probably acquainted with the um, Jewish, the Star of David that Jewish men and women were forced to wear on their uh, concentration camp uniforms and actually on their clothing throughout the 1930s. The homosexual prisoners, when they arrived in concentration camps, were given a pink triangle. Um, it was an upside down triangle. So like that. I'm not doing this well with my hands. But um, the pink triangle was their designation. And if you were Jewish and homosexual, like Gad Beck was, you would have received a, a yellow triangle pointing up and then a pink triangle to put on top of that pointing down. Um, some of the other colors that were used were purple for Jehovah's Witnesses, or red for Soviet prisoners of war. Um, and that was really how the prisoners could tell themselves, tell themselves apart, um, and also how the soldiers could tell um, why someone was imprisoned at the camp. Nicole, do you mind saying something briefly about how the symbol has sort of been reclaimed in a way as a uh, positive identification for some? Sure. So beginning with really the, um, ACT UP movement in the 1980s. Um, the Pink Triangle has become a way to rally primarily homosexual men um, to fight back against government discrimination within healthcare. Um, so the AIDS virus is first discovered in 1969 and it becomes this phenomenon taking place, um, a worldwide pandemic that primarily um, France and the US take the lead in research and understanding how to end the AIDS pandemic, uh, but it is quickly associated with gay men. And because it's associated with gay men, it doesn't really get the funding that it needs that the scientists need in order to end the pandemic. So the act, the organization ACT UP, which I think was founded in 81, but don't quote me on that year, um, uses the pink triangle in order to tell gay men, you know, we've been persecuted before. The, the Germans persecuted us throughout the Holocaust and we continue to be persecuted today. So rally around this triangle um, claim your homosexuality and hopefully we can make a difference. And through ACT UP and other organizations fighting AIDS back in the 1980s through today, um, the number of men and women who are diagnosed with HIV each year has dropped considerably um, over the last 30, wow, it's been 30 years. Um, there was another question in here that I think I lost. Lots of thank yous, thanks guys. I appreciate the thank yous. <laughs> Mara had a follow-up question. She wanted to know about if the triangles were assigned strictly in camps or if they were also something that homosexuals were forced to wear in public, similar to the Star of David. Right, thank you. So with the Star of David, um, the Germans, because they kept really good notes, knew pretty much who all of the Jewish families in major cities and then in rural areas were. And so the stars were assigned at the beginning in 1933, 34, 35, before imprisonment became the, the main way and deportation became the main way that Germany dealt with its Jewish population. Um, for homosexual men, it was a very quick process. You were arrested and then you were um, interrogated and then you were either imprisoned or let go. So it, it was really like a few weeks at most. You were not allowed to leave the jail after you were arrested unless they were deciding that you were not a homosexual. So it wasn't like known homosexuals were allowed to walk around in Berlin. So this, the, the concept of wearing the pink triangle on regular clothes outside of the prison wouldn't have come up because homosexuals were either imprisoned and deported or let go because they were considered not homosexual. 
Um, would SS officers face punishment for the Dolly Boys if caught by superiors? It really depends on the superior. If the superior was also engaging in rape of young boys, then probably not. Um, honestly, there's just not enough research done on this topic. And because homosexuality was considered a psychiatric disorder until 1993 um, here in the US and longer abroad, um, there was a conflation between consensual homosexual acts and rape by prison guards. So there just hasn't been enough research in, you know, what people wanted and what was done to them. Um, people don't ask about homosexuality when they're interviewing Holocaust survivors before 1993, I mean, even since 1993. So there just isn't enough research because it doesn't come up in oral testimony. Um, you know, if you were imprisoned for homosexuality until 1945 in a concentration camp and then freed and then imprisoned again in 54 and obviously not sent to a concentration camp, thank God, but still imprisoned, you don't really want to talk about it afterwards. So like Pierre didn't talk until 79 and he didn't write anything down until 81. Gad didn't talk until 2000, well, no, he, he talked in 1994, but he didn't talk until 1994. So the stigma attached to homosexuality was just so great that people didn't talk about it. And because of that, we don't have the research. Any other questions? I should note though, um, just to flag for any educators interested in locating um, audiovisual testimony clips that talk about the LGBT experiences during the Holocaust, there are several of them that are available um, in the Shoah Foundation virtual library and we would be happy to point you in the right direction. If you're interested, just reach out and I can help you do a little bit of that digging. That was something I used to do um, back during my time with them. Shameless plug by our executive director, who's really awesome and knows all things. Um, <laughs> any other questions? There was one more question that came before, which was, uh, were Christian lesbians used to impregnate? Um, I think the question is, um, if lesbians were forcibly impregnated by Nazi officers in the camps. Well, Christian women who didn't do anything else wrong wouldn't have been in the camps, right? So Christian, wrong, but Christian lesbians um, who weren't prisoners of war, weren't Soviets, weren't Jewish, they were just walking around on the streets, right? I mean, their clubs were regularly raided, but for the most part, if you were a lesbian and you weren't Jewish, you could just walk free. Um, there were programs set up that we don't have a lot of information on around the Lebensraum push, right? So this concept that we need to increase German space and then fill that German space with German babies, where Nazi officials would be suggested to visit um, places where sex workers were known to be. And research shows us that many sex workers are women loving women, whether they're bisexual or homosexual or pansexual or whatever. Um, so there was a concept there that a frigid woman should be raped and impregnated in order to continue the German race. I don't know how much of that was practically applied, but that was the theoretical um, language that was put out by various German organizations between 34-ish and 45. I also just wanna point out for clarification because I received a question about this, um, that the Jewish stars that were forced to be worn on the outside of Jewish people's clothing, that was something that was implemented in 1939 through 45. Um, whereas the identifications that were used in the concentration camps, that's a separate matter. So I just wanted to clarify that one small point, just in case anyone uh, was confused about which we were talking about. Right, I had the picture up, I took it out. I should have left it in, but I'll, I'll, I'll link to it in the follow-up email or send out another one. Sorry, everyone. No, that's great. Any other questions? Okay, so for all the educators who are planning to utilize some of this information in your classrooms, we are sending out a follow-up email um, within the next few days that includes links to most of the sources that I use for this Lunch and Learn. Um, and of course, if you have follow-up questions, you can email change and we'll see where we can send you or answer the questions ourselves. Um, but this is a mandate from the state government. So we really do hope to be a resource for you as you find ways to incorporate this information into your classrooms.
And stay tuned because we have a very full fall calendar. Thank you, Nicole. You did a phenomenal job. This was such an excellent program. Thank you.